So it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you about porphyra today. Porphyra umbilicalis grows in the Atlantic. It's very abundant in the mid to high intertidal zone. And here it is hydrated, but very frequently at low tide, it dries down to having only 5% of its normal water content. So this alga has to uh, survive high light, temperature stress that ranges from being very hot in summer to freezing in winter, and of course drying. The roadmap for what I'm going to tell you about is why we should be interested in red algae and indeed why we need to do more red algal genomes. Features of a porphyra genome, and then I'm going to tell you some stories from our project and hope each of you will find some things that you enjoy. So first of all, the red algae are a very ancient eukaryotic lineage. And this shows some figures from uh, Butterfield's discovery in Arctic Canada of some fossils called Bangiomorpha. And this is a modern Bangia from a Massachusetts coast that he collected. And you can see how similar the morphology is. So the lineage of the Bangiophyceae to which Porphyra belongs is very ancient. And just three months ago, Gibson et al. published a much tighter age uh, determination for the rocks the fossils were in with rhenium osmium dating. And so this date of a billion years of age for, for a fossil Bangiomorpha is a very tight age now. It is widely considered that this is the oldest multicellular eukaryotic fossil. And so that in and of itself is a reason why we should be very interested in this lineage. And of course it means that these organisms have survived a lot of changes in climate and many mass extinctions. Uh, the red algae belong to the Archaeoplastida, which includes the glaucophytes and the green algae and their little offshoot called the land plants. In addition to the importance of the red algae, uh, a heterotroph captured one or more red algae a long time ago. And so by enslaving it, groups like the dinoflagellates, the apicomplexans, the diatoms, brown algae, and haptophytes were formed. These organisms include some of the most important algae involved in biogeochemical cycling on our planet. Diatoms are responsible for 20% of global primary productivity. The apicomplexans contain very serious human pathogens like plasmodium, which causes malaria. And although it's not photosynthetic anymore, its red algal plastid is still essential to its metabolism. And you know dinoflagellates from the zooxanthellae of coral reefs as well as harmful algal blooms. So the imprint of red algal metabolism on Earth's climate system, aquatic food webs, and human health is immense. Uh, Huan Chu and Devashish Bhattacharya added our genome to a previous genomic analysis they published about a year ago. And this is the structure of the red algae. So there was an ancestor that split into an extremophilic group of unicells, and then there are two mesophilic clades. Almost all the species of red algae occur in the Bangiophyceae or the Floridiophyceae. These are what are called seaweeds. And this clade has mostly unicells and small filaments. Um, a, a, while our paper was in press, this nice paper with 37 plastid genomes came up with the same basic structure but found two monophyletic clades within what we call the scrip of, as opposed to the BF. You know, we think of the Bangiophyce and Floridiophyce as our best friends. And uh, they also put subphylum names on these groups, but I'm probably going to call them the script and the BF today. So uh, but you should be interested in this paper because the largest plastid ever sequenced is in this paper, and it comes from this group. All right, so as Dan said, these are edible algae. They're very important as food. Other red algae are also consumed directly as food, as well as producing hydrocolloids like auger and carrageenan. 
it is almost certain that each of you has eaten a red alga within the last day. And uh, it's always nice to eat your work. So this is the strain of porphyra that was sequenced growing in experimental aquaculture on the main coast and on my dinner plate for uh, guests. In Asia, uh, there's quite a lot of the Pacific cousin, which is now called pyropia, but used to be a porphyra. And, uh, you know, the farm value is a billion dollars. So these are really important organisms. And one of the things that we found as we were doing the genome project is that a lot of the things that help porphyra survive stress also contribute to its food value in terms of antioxidants, minerals, vitamins, soluble fiber, and protein. Okay, so these are all very important people. And my two co-PIs, John Stiller and Arthur Grossman, you can remember that John is holding a porphyra-like organism that's about yay big. That's almost as large as any red alga gets. Uh, Nick Bluen was a grad student when the project started in my lab and is now in Wyoming. Simon Prochnick went into the private sector from JGI about eight months ago. He contributed dramatically to the project, and he's the senior author of the genome paper. So uh, this is a figure that is sort of terrifying. When we wrote our community science uh, proposal, we were asked to say what the G plus C content was, and there wasn't a lot of genetic information around, but we estimated from genes in the databases that would be about 53, 54 percent. And so the genome is 66 percent GC overall, but the coding regions, as you can see, average 73 percent and go up to 94 percent. Needlessly to say, this was not a happy sequencing situation. And so the thing that made a big difference was when Jeremy was willing several years ago, when it was still risky and more expensive, to schedule our genome for PacBio. And consequently, uh, uh, Jerry Jenkins was able to then use the Illumina sequencing that did cover part of the gen genome to do indel corrections on the PacBio gene assembly, and we were absolutely giddy with relief. We had a great project of people who worked in many areas of biology, so our manual curation was very significant. And they, they quickly found that there were some long scaffolds that had no ESTs on them, and in fact, when we looked at the genes, they were not porphyra. So following up on one of Dan's suggestions, Simon used principal component analysis and was able to bin a uh, really clean porphyra genome. But at the edges of the bins, there was still some crosstalk, and so our manual curation moved some of the scaffolds back and forth, and we ended up with a genome that is 87.7 megabase pairs in size with 13,125 predicted uh, genes, and the intron density for red algae is high, but still we only have expression evidence for 235 alternative splice forms. So now I'm going to tell you about some of the uh, interesting things that we found, beginning with stress. So uh, people in the project found a very large expansion of heat shock proteins compared to other red algae that grow lower down in the intertidal zone, including of HSP40. There was a large expansion of catalase genes and also of one helix proteins, which protect photosystems. We found the expected osmolites and Liz uh, Fico Bleen and Gervin Michelle at Broskoff did a wonderful job on understanding how the cell wall is put together. Like the extracellular matrix of metazoans, there are a lot of sulfated moieties that are along polysaccharides. And so they found that, in fact, the closest homologs to enzymes that that were identified as being important in the synthesis of porphyrin, the main cell wall polysaccharide, are the metazoans, including in the corals. 
And so that was really interesting. It just shows it's very ancestral. Porphyrin is, uh, as I said, a member of the auger family. It's very important in keeping things flexible as drying occurs, so it's protective against stress. Liz also found that mantid synthesis was in the ancestor of the green and red algae, that it didn't evolve in the grains as had been thought, and mannins are the skeletal component of the porphyra cell wall. Uh, Martin Lohr examined mycosporin-like amino acids, and mycosporin-like amino acids are sunscreens. So you can imagine that porphyra is staked out on the rocks under this blistering sun, and there's a lot of UV exposure, but it has been known to be tolerant. And its uh, main mycosporin is porphyra 334, and this shows the synthetic pathway with four enzymes that are important. Uh, these are they in two different cyanobacteria, but Martin found that there were gene fusions, both in this A, Miss B, and Miss C, Miss D, and although the positions on the strands are reversed, the same thing is true in Chondrus crispus. And so we, uh, we propose that these gene fusions are likely to lead to more efficient production of mycosporin-like amino acids, which will be so important to the survival of this beast. Uh, one of the curious things about porphyra and uh, pyropia is that they have long been known to be very rich sources of vitamin B12. And this has been a mystery because no eukaryote can produce it. So uh, uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine Hellowell and Allison Smith had found that these two enzymes, COB-T and COB-S, and some other microalgae are able to modify prokaryotic pseudocobalamin into cobalamin, which is usable vitamin B12 in eukaryotes. And they found these two enzymes in porphyra umbilicalis. They're not in chondrus crispus. Uh, we also found one of them in pyropia, and we anticipate they're both there and just require some more genomic work. One question is, why does porphyra have both MET-E and MET-H? These are very important forms of methionine synthase, but MET-E is independent of vitamin B12, and MET-H requires vitamin B12. So uh, the red algae seem to have both, and we were attracted to this research that we found on Clamidomonas recently by Shi et al in which they use environmentally realistic heat stress and found that under those conditions, Clamidomonas, which also has both forms of methionine synthase, lost its MET-E. The higher temperatures suppressed its transcription. And so survival of the Clamidomonas was due to the vitamin B12 dependent MET-H, which is more stable. So it's going to be interesting for us to investigate whether MET-H also allows porphyra to survive under these stressful higher temperature conditions and under luxury vitamin B12 that's uh, around, that, that's important. Um, and just a few sheets of this will give you your daily uh, vitamin B12 uh, needs. Okay, so Kristen Blobby Haas is actually in the audience, and there's a very narrow window for an intertidal alga like porphyra to take up the nutrients it needs. So you can think of nutrient acquisition as a stress. Uh, Kristen knew that there were uh, uh, a permease called FTR1 that is part of a high affinity iron transporter in microalgae but was surprised to find them in multicellular reds and in multicellular greens and liverworts and mosses. But you notice that as soon as uh, evolution continues in the land plants and there, no, there uh, are roots that are forming, uh, as, yeah, roots are forming, there is no longer FTR1. So this is a really interesting dynamic in terms of iron uptake. Uh, 
Porphyra has been found among other New England red algae to have unusual potential experimentally and by remediation potential for ammonia in integrated aquaculture. Uh, animals excrete ammonia. So the porphyra could take it up, and this is one of the reasons driving aquaculture development. But Anita Klein found that there was a very large expansion of ammonia transporters in porphyra. So that puts a, a molecular basis on the physiology. Okay, so I'm now going to switch topics a bit, and I want to remind you of the structure of the red algae. So here are the scripts, which don't have many species, at least now, and are unicells and small filaments. And here are the bangiophytes and floridiophytes, which have most of the species. So uh, Glenn Wheeler found that there was a different way of sensing calcium found in the red, that he found in the red algae. And he named them calcium-dependent tyrosine kinase-like proteins. The scripts also have calcium-dependent protein kinases, but they are not found in uh, the bangiophytes and floridiophytes. You can see there are a lot of them down here. And uh, all of the red algae have these uh, calcium-dependent tyrosine kinase-like uh, sensor kinases. Here is a cartoon that he made to show the domains. And so here are the calcium-dependent protein kinases. You can see plants use them, and porphyridium, which is a member of a script, has them, and here's the EF hand domain. Porphyra does not. And here are porphyra and chondrus as examples of the new calcium-dependent tyrosine kinase-like uh, calcium sensors. Okay, so now I want to move to the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is a network of filaments and associated proteins, and the eukaryotic cytoskeleton is essential to intracellular transport, secretion, regulation of cell size and shape, response to environmental signals, mitosis, and cytokinesis. In other words, it's really essential. And uh, the way in which uh, the intracellular transport works is you have an organelle or a vesicle that has a motor protein, in this case myosin, to move things along actin tracks. So we were interested in what Porphyra could tell us about the cytoskeleton of red algae because very little was known about the cytoskeleton in this entire group. And we, of course, wondered whether all three of the motor proteins would be present, dynein and kinesin which move things in different directions on microtubules, and myosin, which moves things on actin microfilaments. And whether other expected nucleators and modifiers of cytoskeleton would be present, especially the actin uh, crawl, uh, branching uh, associated protein, which could support the observed amoeboid motility of porphyra spores. And this chart basically tells you in red uh, what we found. So you can see that as we go up the table from the metazoans, the fungi, the amoebozoa, the green algae and plants to the red algae, there's less and less red. Essentially, we found that the red algae has a very minimal cytoskeleton. Uh, it had been known, of course, for a long time that the red algae do not have flagella, uh, flagella but uh, Dining, the cytoplasmic dining motor was also absent except what is probably a contaminant in chondrus. The higher plants independently lost cytoplasmic dining, but kinesin-14 in higher plants can take its place as the minus-directed motor. And higher plants retain two myosins. Interestingly, knockouts of these result in short stature in the green algae. The red algae have a very small set of kinesins, and Galbieria had been previously reported to have a myosin, and we have been able to extend that to some more scripts, but it is only one myosin. Now, the kinesins that are present in porphyra include uh, kinesin-14, so perhaps even though it's not generally thought to be a cargo transporter, 
it in red algae, just as in the land plants, has become one. But unless one of these other kinesins has been modified from mitotic and other uh, functions in the eukaryotic cell to be a transporter, we don't really know uh, how transport is occurring on microtubules. This shows a phylogenetic tree that Holly Goodson made of the red algal myosins that we found. So Galdieri was already known, and in uh, transcriptomes that were available from these members of the script clade, we found the same myosin. And notice that its closest sister myosin is in the apicomplexans, which is interesting since they have evolved from a red algal secondary endosymbiosis. So how do the red algae do so much with so little? Because their spores can move by amoeboid motility. They can send out polarized extensions. They do grow, obviously. They have contractile motility in terms of the cleavage and cytokinesis. So possible workarounds. Uh, we found septins in porphyra and, so, and also in porphyridium. They form a different cytoskeletal system than the ones we usually think about. They may be particularly important in some of the red algae at least. Formins, which cause actin microfilaments to form straight arrays as opposed to the cross links that are normally associated with amoeboid movement are present. Uh, we would predict that if, in fact, formin is nucleating the microfilaments so that spores can crawl, it's going to be slower, but perhaps effective. This apicomplexin-like myosin is present, as I said, in uh, some of the scripts in Galdieria. And Moto et al. suggested that EF1-alpha might actually participate mechanistically in causing cleavage in one red unicell, cyanidioshizon. And we imagine that there has been a repurposing of some of the mitotic kinesins in the red algae to carry cargo. But still, it is a small known set of cytoskeletal machinery with many of the expected microtubule and microfilament associated proteins missing. And so there will be consequences. And a consequence that we think is important to think about is that the red algae compared to other multicellular eukaryotic lineages never get tall. So we have blue whales that everybody knows are the largest animal, and they have uh, motor neurons that are 30 meters long, where there's a lot of important cytoskeletal traffic to maintain the cells and sensing. Some of the fungal fruiting structures are very large, and in Golden Gate Park, there's a description of about a 500-meter diameter individual fungus that, of course, is in hyphae. Uh, the redwoods are large. Pollen tubes in the land plants are very actively streaming cells. Kelps are large, and the red algae are not. So, uh, we think that one thing we might think about in terms of a limiting stature of this particular multicellular group and the fact that there are no large cells is that uh, it has a basis in the cytoskeletal losses from the last common eukaryotic ancestor. And with that, I want to thank the Community Science Program of the JGI and the National Science Foundation, which sponsored our grant. There were over 60 scientists outside of JGI, and I know of at least 15 people at JGI who were super important to our project, and I think that probably means there are 45 or 50. Please introduce yourselves to me. And we're now paddling into the future because genome projects create hypotheses, and now we are in a, in a, a testing phase in which we can make use of this information. And we had quite a bit of fun during our project. So I'll be happy to answer any questions.